see a lot of important core investment and formal training as part of the region part of social development plan. The first speaker is um, the uh, uh, Lila Riley, uh, Regional Park uh, Neighborhood Association. This is the region. We're no stranger to this community, so we are aware of the, what takes place. Uh, you know, when you have a plug or something, or Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to address uh, in 2020 again the issue of poverty in our communities, uh, and specifically Regent Park. Um, on the overhead, I have information from the Social uh, Development Committee that reports that 582 jobs were created um, in the last 10 years. For the record, uh, the city, the province, and the federal government, government have invested $1 billion in, um, in Regent Park alone the, in the last 10 years. So this number, 582 num uh, employment opportunities created, is very low compared to the investment on the buildings. Um, we have a social development plan that is part of the budget, and we just found out today that is not being, it's not, it's, it's mentioned in the budget, but it, it has not included in the budget process. So we are very dis, um, dis, dis, disappointed by that decision by the SDFA. We hope that they will reconsider this decision so that we move forward with our SDP plan for Regent Park. Aside from that, the community of Regent Park has been very active. Uh, for that, in that regard, we have been in touch with uh, Toronto Community Housing and the Regent Park Neighborhood Association because we are a very active community. We understand that we are selecting a developer for phases four and five. So we are not happy with the results of these 582 jobs created in the last 10 years. See, note that we have a poverty reduction strategy that was funded by the city in the year 2015, created by former Councilor Pam McConnell. Unfortunately, um, the numbers are very depressing. We only have created 55 jobs according to this report on page number five. So, the community has reached out to the Community Benefits Network who are helping us to develop the first ever Community Benefits Agreement with Toronto Community Housing. I'm glad to see, staff, to see staff from Community Housing present today because we want to remind them that we are waiting for them to, to, to know if we have accepted our Community Priorities Report. We want, we want to know if they are really serious to, un, to understand how important it is to create meaningful jobs in the community because, as you are aware, on July the 4th, we, we lost a member of the community here. Um, on January the 4th, we have a vigil, and we remember that how disappointed it is that we don't have jobs for our members of our community. Ahmed Jahad could be alive today, and we have more job opportunities that are meaningful and direct to help them. So we continue investing in we want to request to continue investing in schools in our community and not for police. That is the message always from the community. But I don't know for one reason or another, the city seems not to understand this problem that violence is related to poverty. Poverty in our community is 40%. So regardless of what um, um, we, are, uh, we are promising by this SDFA, our community believes that a community benefits agreement signed with, with Toronto Community Housing and the future developer of phases four and five can be meaningful to create jobs that are traditionally impossible for people who have mental illnesses, 
So in that regards, I want to replay, if it's possible, uh, and it helped because I want to post a, a video that is on, uh, it's available? Sorry. I'm, I'm having problems with my computer today. I'm, I'm very sorry, but the invitation was to ask Mayor Tory to come to our community meetings so we can explain to him what is behind our community benefits agreement that will help residents of Region Park to achieve meaningful work, employment, and not to miss another member of our community due to gun violence. And we have to invest in our communities, not in policing. Thank you very much.
prefer to talk about it in a greater context and how we use social development plans and, and the particular need and, and then start relating it to the sort of part. Part of the problem, part of the reason we see that they, they might be smaller and not going into the investment is uh, we started with a plan that doesn't have to catch hand because a lot of it is hands on and then we'll ask the federal government to help us with this and we'll ask the French government to help us with this piece. Do you think we'd be better off if, if while we, we love those partners, there should be a base amount that we're willing to spend for ourselves with city dollars. So in the years where they're not helping out, that, you know, politically or economically or whatever, there's still a steady flow going into that community from the city dollars. Is that, that part of it? Some of the programs we go in and, and it's not so much the program investments program, program uh, not a system, but program, which means beginning in the middle and then end. Should we have more system dollars going in there? Uh, many of these uh, investments are hard to track, and uh, what we need is a uh, very much coordinated uh, uh, piece. And I think uh, a good question was asked by our counselor, which, which she asked and said, who does, who's, who's responsible for social development? If you put it, uh, the answer that was given was SDFA. SDFA is responsible for that, and what that means is that the city council is responsible for that. And a base budget of social development is necessary. It's good to uh, facilitate conversations with other levels of government to get double the impact, but I carry it around uh, Leadership has come from the city council, and you have to invest in what you strategize, right? You, you create the strategies, you create the plans, and you have to match that with the resources you have. Right, but sometimes you can't match because they just sort of disappear for five years. Our investment should continue. Yes, and, 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 and that's what we're Yes, so what, what we're asking for is not an, an exuberant amount of money. What we're asking for is a, a coordinator who will facilitate our role because the old SDP did not have a coordinator. It was uh, who, who said. It was trying to, uh, call all the partners in the neighborhood, it was trying to ignite that to the city table. Right? And without four years, that's impossible. And a base budget for action plan is required, and I think given the level of investments that is being directed in the neighborhood, we have to uh, get uh, the city as a leader in the middle. Okay, thank you, that's very helpful. Thank you very much, Carol. Any other questions? Okay, see so you yeah. Our next speaker is Elise. Uh, yeah. Thank you Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Andrew Dunn with the uh, uh, Ocean Park Human Benefits Coalition. I'm uh, here uh, to support not just the request that was made by uh, the previous speakers, uh, Shamayla and Nicole, uh, but also uh, to call on to call our city council to action by looking at all the levels of government when it comes to uh, investment in the park, specifically uh, the housing crisis. So uh, I'm going to start with a couple of comments as context, and then uh, I'll probably end up with my request. Uh, the context is uh, that my colleague said earlier, the revitalization of Jim Park is a $1.1 billion investment by all levels of government. And uh, my friend Miguel pointed to the amount of jobs that were created, about three dozen, which is ludicrous, uh, and actually not a return of investment that the residents of Regent Park uh, were made uh, to leave. Uh, and what I think uh, we have is an opportunity for these four and five to correct the mistakes that were made. And one of the most important ways to do so is by committing can be a framework that specifically has hot targets for local employment, uh, specifically has uh, specific targets when it comes to housing and public ownership. Because what we don't is we don't want Regent Park to be a neighborhood of just millionaires. If you don't need to be any housing, and if you don't, if you're not being wet, you basically are a millionaire. And what we hope is our city will show leadership by working with other forms of government to make sure that those investments are made. Now, I'm happy to let you folks know that the residents of the Park are being very engaged through the community benefits effort. The hundreds of people show up to a community meeting where they made uh, the prioritize what they would like to see when it comes to investment. And that is how development should start. It should start from communities. It should start from residents. It should start from developers with a grand uh, plan for our community, which is sometimes out of touch when it comes to the realities of those living in our community. The other point that I'd like to make is that we have met with representatives from the provincial government and we met with the Office of Bill Murnau just yesterday. And what we have realized is that it is support for the investment that we're looking for. But what is lacking is the leadership, the coordination, by making sure that all the representatives from all of us meet the folks from our community to speak to how they will find the priorities, the priorities identified by the community who are bearing that very engaged process that actually involve uh, those that are sometimes in work when it comes to consultations. So, my ask is a simple ask. If you would like our, not just our city councilor, but also the mayor's office and this council to take a leadership role in making sure that the $1.1 billion investment that's going to reach the park is well suited to support residents that now are fighting all the possible to the city. Um, lastly, 
Uh, I want to thank uh, the staff uh, and the City of Toronto for being very accessible, passing on information uh, to my colleagues and people who are uh, trying to make sure that the key benefits uh, framework that was passed by the City of Toronto is actually applied in capital projects and development uh, across the city. So, thanks so much for your uh, time, and I hope uh, we will see more investments when it comes to the projects identified by the residents of the region. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. I just tried to see if there are any questions for you. Are there any questions for you? I'll see them. Any questions for them? So, through you, Mr. Chair, and the commercial staff, uh, with respect to the tracking of job creation as an outcome of the social development maximization part, um, what type of data is available in 2007 when it's supposed to be again, and what is available today? What are you tracking in this? is really a workforce development goal, matching employers' needs with the jobs, uh, with the uh, skills that clients have, and uh, matching those two, uh, and tracking the jobs that result. Um, so that is what is going to track. We can only track, of course, those jobs that were registered with tests. Uh, there were probably jobs outside, um, created by TCH or the developer, that were not registered with tests. Tess's role is to focus on the OW client, but it's largely the tracking limited to that. One of the things that Tess did uh, in 2016 when we opened the new center at Region Park was to make sure that we had a partnership with Employment Ontario. That's why we're co-located with Dixon Hall uh, at Region Park, so because they're focusing on the no, uh, non-OW client. Thank you. I think my question was more direct at SPFA in my conversations with this director before the director, I asked him who owned the social development plan and he said it's SEFA. So my question is really for SEFA. If you own the social development plan, um, what mechanisms are available in tracking the job creation today versus what was the one that was at the when it was the end? We've got more and better tools now than we had when the social development plan was created in 2007. We are working our commitment framework for to create those vehicles, be able to track the kind of jobs to get those jobs and the long-term uh, longevity of those jobs. So that is a work in progress that we hope to have up running in Q2 2021. And so with respect to moving forward, um, I, I see that we're going to sort of went back in time to, to try to figure out what happened. So you can move forward and report show today in 2020 numbers, um, which is also very difficult. We have to go back and figure out where, where, where did all the data go. Um, with respect to moving forward, the, the data collection and how we manage the information and where the actual business dollars and numbers are to me and what the outcome is. Are you confident that you will have better tools in terms of tracking, monitoring, and reporting to ensure greater accountability and transparency? Through the chair, yes, Councillor. We've been called upon uh, for, for a variety of community to be able to track the benefits as they present themselves, whether it's within public projects or within private projects. We, do, we are getting more and more experience through the Westdale and Snow work that is, is ongoing. We're learning some of the uh, problems, issues, and uh, uh, it's solutions around uh, tracking jobs. I may have a little time, but just one final question. With respect to the, the learning of phases one and three, I think the organization is fairly new to TCHC in terms of our campus organization. The learnings that I've taken in phase one and three and what's going to fully incorporate itself as we move forward to four and five, what are some of the biggest takeaways that you will have to do to make sure that SEFA truly owns as well as uh, champions uh, the social development plan moving forward. We will need to work with both the community, with TCHC, with TESS, and with the developer as we move forward into the next phase of the region park. Thank you. Okay. Uh, any more questions? Can you see that? Just speak as long as you can. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. 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 You know, a lot of the reasons why we're actually getting in this direction now in terms of bringing this, this type of dialogue back into this particular standing unit has a lot to do with the number of member motions that I actually moved in 2019 to say, let's bring it all to light uh, in this room, let's invite the community for dialogue, and let's make sure that everything that we do in Region Park is actually going to be um, a bit of a study. But also, in terms of making quick visits we need to, the things that we need to do well, we need to do better. Um, the
so that we're, uh, so that the laws can come to the call, so that the local laws do get to the, to the community. Um, but I think that what I've seen over the past year, uh, Mr. Chair, is that the city has not really taken on the proactive role of championing social development. That has been, in my observation, one of the biggest pieces that's missing. As I as I speak to neighborhoods, and as I speak to community members, what can the city do now as we're getting into the final phase of the law to make sure that we don't and what they said to me is that they're, they're really proud of building facilities. There's no doubt about it. We've got some fantastic new facilities. But they do feel that the economic opportunities have not been shared with the community as broadly as they could have been. And when I spoke to this earlier, it was Archer, you know, who owns the social development land? So they basically, who owns the investments in people? Whose job is to make sure that people are invested in? And, and I asked him, is it TCHC? Is it the developer? Is it the city? And he didn't think, he didn't have it on us. He said, it's the city. So now, what we need to do is really own it. And I think we own it, right? We need to refund it, and we need to make sure we put those investments in an intentional way where we document it and move it forward and also catch it out with progress. The number of costs that have been reported as, as were created either in the year or in the way has come from 82 over this many years. I don't think that's a, it's a great performance, and perhaps they can just have to that not captured. That's really if they didn't capture them, they're not going to get correct. So we've got to do a better, better job of catching that. Um, and at the end of the day, we don't necessarily capture the information that we need to be able to go back and say, this is what we've been tested, this is in the other. And why would anyone want to do the revitalization again? So because we can put this person on the gate, you never get away, because how's that going to happen? Yes, you've got one side coming up, and you'll make a lot, you'll make a lot of difference for so those communities to know that they're not just getting shot in the road, it's a crack in the game, and that's what it's going to be one of the things. And the shootings and the violence and poverty that we've seen in the region will hopefully at some point in time be you know, a reflection of the past and not
computers, but if, if it doesn't have a future of success, then we're not going to get any of it in any of the other projects to come. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Council Carroll. Councilor Christmas. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have an amendment uh, or a motion that I make on behalf of uh, Councilor Montan. Montan, if I can be placed on the screen. Um, as the local councilor has said it all, I will just uh, reiterate that revitalization and, and Councilor Carroll just spoke about the so called big three uh, are about people. Um, and I'll just note that things in the social development plans are central to that. And so I will simply say with, with Alexander Park, which is in my community, uh, we're we for the social development plan as well. Uh, SDFA, TCHC, TESS, the local community have been at the table in the development of that. Uh, and it will be coming soon to this committee in terms of the next steps. And we have learned a tremendous amount from Regent Park in the development of that in terms of paving the way. And just as we're learning lessons from Regent, uh, I'm looking forward to having the conversation at this community table around Alexander Park. And I want to thank staff for their hard work alongside us in the development. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Councilor Chrissy.
be who he feels it the most knows it the best. And I think this is something that we have to listen to so we have to work with the local community as well. So we're doing that and that we need to do more. And um, the report is before us. And so we are sending it off to uh, the city of Toronto and we're asking for another report to come to us. And this matter will be addressed. But of course, as we go forward, we want to make sure that we're able to better track who's actually done it, how are they done it, what's the impact. Understand the measurements. It's a measurement that will help us in terms of realizing whether or not we're successful or not. So uh, there are two motions on, on the screen. Uh, the first one is uh, the motion that's moved by Councillor Cressy. This concludes uh, the presentation and the uh, discussion on item 11.4. We are just uh, going to conclude it with this light of missions and hope that people come to join us at the afternoon meetings as we develop the community benefits agreement with the, third, with the developer of phases 45. That would be very meaningful jobs for the community. Thank you.